we come to the last last talk by Tin Nguyen. And before he gives his presentation, let, let me just give uh, a little bit of a background so you know who's uh, speaking this evening. Uh, so Tin, of course, is an SVD priest uh, of the Australian province. And you all probably know that he comes from Vietnam and uh, he came to Australia in 1998 uh, at that time for further studies. And so his, he specializes in mission studies and theology of religions. Um, Tin has a keen interest in interreligious dialogue and cross-cultural relations. And he's been working, involved in different interfaith networks in Victoria. For example, the interfaith network of the Greater Bandano, uh, the Darabin Interfaith Network, uh, the Marunda Interfaith Network, as well as the Knox Interfaith Network. Uh, presently, um, Tin is uh, uh, serving at the Janssen Spirituality Center, uh, which is an SVD Center for Interreligious Dialogue and Cross-Cultural Relations, uh, located in Bologna, where Bill is also at the, at the moment. And um, Tin also teaches comparative studies uh, of religions and interreligious dialogue at Yara Theological Union uh, in Melbourne. And um, um, some of you may know that Tin is in the middle of his sabbatical, and recently uh, Tin went to Thailand uh, for his sabbatical, where he spent some time in a Buddhist monastery to uh, uh, to, to uh, practice uh, meditation. So maybe Tin can also share that experience with us as part of his talk. Uh, but now I turn it over to you, and we look forward to hearing your input this evening. And also, as uh, you listen to Tin, feel free to write out comments or questions in the chat box, and we will address those comments and questions um, uh, after Tin finishes his presentation. Tin, go ahead. Thank you, Anthony, for your introduction, very kind introduction of me. Um, and uh, I'd like to share my screen now. Uh, can you uh, make me uh, the co-host or something to share the screen? Yeah. Please, thank you. That's, uh, the host has to do that. Yeah, my uh, conversation today is not so much about academic writing or presentation, but rather it is a, a personal reflection with some reviews of the documents of the church on interreligious dialogue. But first of all, let me uh, share this screen with you, uh, which I uh, really love, uh, especially the the verse by Hanku, he says, no peace among the nations without peace among the religions. And no peace among the religions without dialogue between religions. And no dialogue between the religions without in the investigation of the foundation of the religions. Um, and as we know that uh, religions don't dialogue, but people do dialogue. Uh, so religions are institutions uh, and people belong to religions, they do dialogue. And on the screen, um, uh, there are two photos. And the first one uh, of uh, Pope Francis, uh, when he visited uh, Sri Lanka in 2015, I think, and on this occasion, he was presented a, a special piece of cloth um, by a Hindu uh, leader. And on the other side uh, is a photo of uh, Dalai Lama in dialogue with uh, Father uh, Lawrence uh, Freeman and uh, Benedictine. Uh, so with this, I would like to go into my sharing. Uh, 
uh, and the conversation, my conversation will include five parts. Uh, the first is the review of the conciliar teaching of the church on interreligious dialogue. The second part will be a, a short review of the post conciliar teaching also on interreligious dialogue. The third part will be a review of the FABC, the Federation of Asian Bishop Conferences on the teaching of interreligious dialogue. And the fourth uh, part will be uh, the living interreligious dialogue in Australia. It's a personal observation. I've, I've done some research on this and I'd like to share a part of it uh, uh, in, in this evening uh, conversation. And then I will conclude with my personal reflection on interreligious living. So now let me go into uh, details. But first of all, uh, let us listen to a uh, watch a, a video clip <laughs> on interreligious dialogue. So hopefully you can uh, you have a clear audio and video for this video clip. We are Three Stooges fans, actually. Um, in fact, we are the very incarnation of their famous line, we tried to think, but nothing happened. We began working together. We did what many interfaith groups do. We shared with each other from the wisdom of our spiritual traditions. He gave so like up on the Let's try again. He gave up on the That's how it was for the first three years. <laughs> the passage I was reading was from the prophet Micah, calling us to act justly, to love kindness, and to walk with integrity. The passage I was reading is from the Gospel according to John, where Jesus is instructing his followers on the meaning of unconditional love. And the verse from the Quran says, repel evil with something which is better so that your enemy becomes your intimate friend. So you see beautiful words from each of our traditions. But the problem is we're all stuck in patterns of behavior. Here's our favorite teaching story. The mullah goes to work Lunchtime opens his lunch pail box, and what does he find? A cheese sandwich. Second day, third day, fourth day, another cheese sandwich. He says, I hate these cheese sandwiches. Finally, his puzzled co-workers say, Mullah, why don't you go home and say to your wife, please, make me a different kind of sandwich. The Mullah says, I'm not married. Who makes them? I do. When 9-11 revealed a far more serious kind of stuckness, I immediately called Jamal. I knew him. We had never worked together. And I invited him to share with me at the Shabbat service that week because it was crucial. It was crucial to offer a more authentic face of Islam than the face that created the fear of all Muslims supported by the media. So Rabbi Ted and I became good friends. Then we became good friends with Pastor Don McKenzie. And soon I realized that Ted and Don are two of the best Muslims I know. We had a shoot them. <laughs> but of course they missed lousy shots. <laughs> so I immediately explained that the word Muslim simply means one who surrenders one's attachment to the ego. So as the Quran says, one can bring a heart turned in devotion to God. They, under they understood completely and we averted a major global crisis. 
Thanks be to God. <laughs> We, we marked the first anniversary of 9-11 with an event at my church, and after it was over and we were debriefing, the three of us looked at each other and said, we can't stop now. And our work has evolved with uh, a framework that contains the idea that true interfaith dialogue can lead to effective collaboration on the moral issues facing our world today. People have asked us, why is interfaith dialogue so difficult? And one of the reasons we suspect has to do with the confusion between the particular and the universal. Every authentic spiritual path is an avenue to a shared universal, but that universal is far greater than any particular path. And when the particular path assumes that it owns the universal. When a Jew says, we are the only chosen people, when the Christian says, the only way to God is through Jesus, when the Muslim says, the Jews and Christians got it wrong and we finally got it right, we're in for serious global difficulties. Spirituality is inclusive. Spirituality points to the absolute interconnectedness of all being. In interfaith dialogue, we are able to share with each other the beautiful teachings in our traditions focused on oneness and unconditional love and compassion. But if we are to truly engage we must share as well those areas that have been the taboos, the areas in each of our own traditions which are inconsistent with those core teachings. Inconsistencies like exclusivity, violence, inequality of men and women, and homophobia, especially exclusivity. And I'm right about that. That's my story. And you're and sticking, sticking to it. To it. Okay. <laughs> you know, we laugh to keep from crying often, but we also laugh because it gives us hope. And it gives us hope because comedy always eclipses tragedy in the same way that the oneness, the unconditional love, and the compassion can eclipse the woundedness and the brokenness of our world in God's eyes. Nothing is ever irreparably broken. My participation in interfaith dialogue has given me the opportunity to acknowledge the Christian repudiation of Judaism, of Islam. In fact, the repudiation of anyone and anything not truly Christian, not truly Christian. For many non-Christian people, the cross has become a symbol of an oppressive and arrogant triumphalism that has led to a tragic and destructive repudiation. For me, the cross shows us the extent to which one can and sometimes must go to make unconditional love real. I look forward to the day when the cross symbolizes the unconditional love that Jesus came to teach. In some very remarkable verses, the Quran says that if Allah wanted, Allah could have made all of us, all of humanity, one single community. But out of a divine design, God chose to create diversity so that as the Quran says, you might get to know the other. Can you get to know the other on a human level? Not to change the other, but simply to connect heart to heart. This is a very critical verse. Sometimes the institution of religion makes this difficult. Here's another very well-known story. The spirit of God comes down and reveals certain basic truths to some people. But then the devil comes along and says, 
let me organize that for you. And that sometimes is called religion. You see, interfaith is not about conversion. It's about completion. Becoming a more complete, fully human. And from this place of inner spaciousness, we can then collaborate on projects which are dear to all of our hearts. Issues of social justice and earth care. That is why this beloved 13th century sage Rumi says, in fact, he uttered, Oh God, you have created this I, you, we, they, to play the game of adoration with yourself. Let's play this game of adoration. Our theme song contains words in Arabic, Hebrew, and English. It's all one and I am as I am. It's all one and I am as I am. Um, yes, uh, it's a long uh, video clip, but uh, it's um, presented some issues that we encountered in interreligious uh, dialogue. As it says, we always or, or we often encounter problems when we claim. So now we move into the conciliar teaching on interreligious dialogue of the church. And in these teachings, we can see the uh, struggles that the church tried to try to make sense of uh, the path of dialogue. So the first uh, document I'd like to present is uh, Ecclesiam Suum, published uh, by Pope Paul VI. And uh, this document lays a key foundation for the development of the church teaching on dialogue. The first time ever, that the term dialogue was formally applied in the teachings of the church as an expression of mission. And this document uh, shows some points of concern for dialogue, how the church should adapt herself, her mission to the contemporary situations and circumstances. Yes, the Pope sees that the church is a bit far behind from the, the world, so now, uh, we cannot control the world. So we got to dialogue with the world. So how the church could guard herself against the danger of dangerous philosophies such as a naturalism, relativism, atheism, and communi communism. All these theories and philosophies were promoted by then, boldly in the world. And finally, how the church should approach all people and bring salvation to all. So um, this document says that dialogue is a, an evangelical duty which aims to bring the light of faith and the gift of grace to the world distorted by faulty ideologies and theories as we named them previously. And that's why this document called this type of dialogue is dialogue of salvation. And any dialogue is dialogue of salvation, I believe. Dialogue uh, is a recognized method of the apostolate. So this document recognized all the best possible approaches of the church apostolic mission. So a word of conclusion for this document, the, the document says, we rejoice and find great consolation in the fact that this dialogue both inside and outside the church has already begun. 
and the church today is more li alive than ever before. But we could see that yes, it's a new, uh, fresh uh, spirit in the church. But the aims, the purpose of this dialogue is again to insert the church agenda, especially in terms of so, uh, uh, mission into the world. So we move to the next one and we see how the church struggles with its teaching on interreligious dialogue. And the second uh, document is Nostra Etate. Uh, we just celebrated its um, uh, anniversary recently. And uh, Nostra Etate uh, moved to a, a, another level, uh, places all religions, including Christianity, on an equal level by affirming that from the ancient times down to the present time, there is found among various peoples a certain perception of that hidden power which hovers over the course of things and over the events of human history. At times, some indeed have come to the recognition or the concept of a supreme being, like uh, addressed in Buddhism, or even of a father as in Christianity. And this document states that the, the Catholic Church rejects nothing that is true and holy in other religions, but treasures, respect, welcome, and this is important, promotes those good values. So, so the mission of the church is to promote the good values of other religions within itself and also in the world because they also show a ray of that truth which enlightens all people. So without reservation, Nostria Tete recognizes the validity of truth and grace found among diverse peoples and faith traditions. The council believes that through dialogue, the church seeks to uncover positive values, both in the hearts of individuals not, not only in the traditions, but first in the hearts of individuals and in religious traditions. Mission in this sense is not merely seeking to witness to Christian values and truth, but also to promote the good values found in other faith traditions. So it states, let Christians, while witnessing to their own faith and way of life, acknowledge preserve and encourage the spiritual and moral good found among non-Christians, as well as their social and cultural values. So it opens the horizons of both understanding on and of mission in the church in terms of uh, dialoguing with other religions. And we move to the next uh, document, which is Agentes and in the spirit, spirit of Nostra, Nostra Etate, a gentist also emphasizes the need to accept within other religions elements of truth and grace, treasures which, which God has distributed among the nations of the earth and values of the ascetical ascet, <laughs> and contemplative life. However, unlike Nostra Aetate, Agentes, influenced by the Lumen Gentium, does not fully recognize the validity of truth and grace in other religions, but treats the truth and grace found among other religions and cultures as sort of sacred presence of God, or as a preparation for the gospel. And therefore, these need to be cleansed healed, uplifted, and perfected for the glory of God. So the council is struggling with where it positions itself in terms of understanding of, uh, of interreligious dialogue and how to apply interreligious dialogue in its mission and its life. And we move to post-conciliar teaching of the church on interreligious dialogue. And the first document 
is uh, selected is uh, Evangeli uh, uh, Nunciandi, uh, also published by Pope Paul VI. And this document directs the church's attention to the dialogical aspect of mission of the church. It considers non-Christian religions as the living expressions of the soul of the vast peoples since they possess in innumerable seeds of the world. So it's acknowledged that, which can constitute a true preparation for the gospel. So still, they are still a preparation for the gospel uh, or for the seeds of the word of God. So this document does not place dialogue within the fundamental mission of the church since it views Christianity as a supernatural religion or the one true religion. And it views other religions as natural religions. So uh, Paul Nitter make a remark on this uh, document. He says, this encyclical does not fully support the church in the process of its dialogue with the people of other faiths. Uh, it limits itself. Its main purpose is that the church should dialogue with the world and non Christians in order to evangelize them. So that is the main purpose of this uh, uh, document. And we move to uh, dialogue and mission uh, published by Secretariat for Non Christians. Uh, and it is for the first time ever interreligious dialogue through this document is officially listed as one of the principal elements of the church mission. So it's not until 1984 interreligious dialogue take the full form of its own. This document gives interreligious dialogue a broader definition, which says, it or interreligious dialogue means not only discussion, but also includes all positive, constructive, interreligious relations. So it's about relationships uh, with individuals and communities of other faith. This means interreligious dialogue is not limited only to words, concepts, beliefs, but includes all forms of positive and constructive relations. The document places interreligious dialogue within the church salvific mission, as it states in the church, uh, state that the church enters into dialogue with other uh, people of other religions in order to walk together, journey together towards the truth and to work together in projects for common good and common concern. In this sense, Interreligious dialogue is treated as a necessary vehicle in which both the church and other faiths journey together in companionship toward the truth and toward the kingdom of God. And we move to another document, important document, um, Redemptorist Missio, published by Pope John Paul II. But before then, in uh, 1986, uh, Pope John Paul II invited all religious leaders in the world to ACC to pray for peace in the world. And this event marked a milestone in interreligious dialogue of the church and of the world. And four years later, uh, uh, Redemptorist Missio was published. Uh, and this document views interreligious dialogue as a part of the church evangelizing mission. And it is not in opposition to the mission at Tentes, but has special links with that mission and is one of its expressions. And Redemptorist Missio legitimizes interreligious dialogue as a part of the church evangelizing mission, one of the expressions of the mission at Tentes, or a method or means of mutual knowledge and enrichment. It reminds us that interreligious dialogue, therefore, should not originate from tactical concerns or self-interest, 
but must be based on hope and love in order to bring the mutual advancement in the purification and conversion that lead to the kingdom. And this document views other religions as a positive challenge for the church. So other religions is a ch positive challenge for the church because they stimulate the church both to discover and acknowledge the signs of Christ's presence and of the working of the Holy Spirit where it wills, eh? as well as to examine more deeply her own identity. So other religions have the church to, to go deeper into her own identity and to bear witness to the fullness of revelation which she has received in for the good of all. And this document also emphasizes that in dialogue, both partners, be Christian or non-Christians, are led to in the mutual purification and conversion. And it says those engaged in dialogue must be consistent with their own religious traditions and convictions. So here it put aside about uh, conversion uh, or change of faith and be open to understanding those of other party without pretense or close-mindedness, but with truth, humility, frankness, knowing that dialogue can enrich each side. However, when speaking about the relationship between proclamation and interreligious dialogue in the mission of the church, this document places proclamation prior to interreligious dialogue. As it says, proclamation is the permanent priority of mission. The reason for this is because proclamation gives substance to missionary activity proper and makes up the climax and fullness of the church mission. Furthermore, this document also says that dialogue should be conducted and implemented with the conviction that the church is the ordinary means of salvation and that she alone possesses the fullness of the means of salvation. So now, like uh, in the video clip, uh, this statement uh, claims the, um, uh, the universality of Christianity in terms of salvation. Now we move to the another important document uh, that is Dialogue and Proclamation published by Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. And now it is renamed uh, the Dicastery for Interreligious Dialogue. And this document affirms that interreligious dialogue and proclamation are interrelated, but not interchangeable. Uh, interrelated but not interchangeable. They are distinctive. These two aspects of evangelizing mission are authentic, legitimate, and necessary elements which constitute the one mission of the church. One mission has two elements. And this document inserts that interreligious dialogue is one distinctive way in which the church fulfills its role as sacrament. Even in the absence of proclamation, interreligious dialogue takes its full effect as the form of evangelization. It says, I quote, whether proclamation be possible or not, the church pursues her mission if in full respect for freedom through interreligious dialogue, witnessing to and share the gospel values. And dialogue and proclamation does not consider interreligious dialogue as, a, as merely aiming at mutual understanding and friendly relationships, but as liberation and salvation. So it takes a full effect in terms of mission and evangelization. And now we go to Pope Francis uh, and interreligious dialogue uh, is hospitality and agape. On the 4th of February 2019, Pope Francis made a joint uh, declaration with 
Ahmed El Tayyab on human fraternity and for the world peace and living together, which is not merely a milestone in relations between Christianity and Islam, but also pre uh, represents a message with a strong impact on the international scene. And in the same spirit, uh, Pope Francis uh, issued this uh, encyclical, uh, uh, Frat Fratelli Tutti, uh, which emphasizes the importance of building human fraternity and social friendship. It opens up the world, inviting the world to open, engaging with the world, and it invites the church to engage with the world in dialogue. And the Pope reminders, uh, reminds the, the, the church and also the world that as society becomes even more globalized, it makes us neighbors, but it doesn't make us brothers and sisters. Therefore, we need to rebuild our wounded world by promoting a culture of encounter which enables one and all to be compassionate to be passionate about meeting others, seeking points of contact, building bridges, planning a project that includes everyone. So now we move to, uh, we shift from the Vatican into a small, smaller uh, area that is the Asia. Uh, and we look at the uh, teaching of the FABC on interreligious dialogue. In the process of renewal uh, to be a church for the people of Asia, and the church in Asia is a minority, uh, the FABC realizes that having dialogue with others helps the church to understand more about itself and its mission. Dialogue in the view of FABC is intrinsic to the very life of the church and the essential mode of all evangelization. Dialogue can free the church from becoming a self-centered community. And this is a, 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 an issue for the church for many, many decades, self-centered community. So interreligious dialogue, free the church from becoming a self-centered community and link it with the people in all areas and dimensions of their lives. The church, therefore, must be a community of continual dialogue. Through dialogue, they believe the local churches and others learn from one another uh, how to enrich themselves spiritually and culturally, how to work more effectively together on the common task for the human development, uh, to clarify problems of prejudices and misinformation against Christianity, to challenge religious and cultural nationalism, to promote good cultural and religious values of the peoples, and to create a new world order. That is the ambition of the FIBC. And FIBC identifies four dialogue partners, three dialogue partners, Asian religions, Asian cultures, and the immense multitude of the poor. In this, the FIBC first acknowledged other religions' great contributions to the shaping of the history and culture of Asian nations. It is firmly believed that only through dialogue with other religions can the church discover in them the seat of the word of God. So now the church turned to others to discover the seat of the word of God and the fruitful presence of the Holy Spirit. Interreligious dialogue is viewed as the venue where Christian spirituality can be enriched by other Asian spiritualities. So they are open to receive from others uh, spiritualities. Interreligious dialogue offers the church the opportunity to express its faith and to bring witness to others and finally list both the church and others to a stage where they are mutually purified, healed, and rich, and make whole in the light of the word of God. An Asian bishop sees a need to develop a holistic se sense 
of the fourfold dialogue. So we know fourfold dialogue, dialogue of life, dialogue of action, dialogue of discourse, and dialogue of religious experience. And they focus more on the dialogue of life, which they believe that is a continual challenge for the church. Because this form of dialogue is a task for the whole church and it should take place in every situation. They emphasize the indispensable role of the lay people in this type of dialogue because lay people are the ones most called to this living dialogue because they live in a more direct and day-to-day -day contact with people of other faiths. And FIBC also pro proposed a new vision for the church and its mission. They call new way of being and becoming church. And they, pro they propose a few ways. Uh, the first one is to be being with the people and responding to their needs with great sensitivity to the presence of God in the cultures and other religious uh, traditions and witnessing to the values of the kingdom through presence, solidarity, sharing, and the word of God. And they develop an in integral understanding of mission. They call Christian discipleship in Asia today, service to life. With this view, the church embodies a holistic vision of mission, which promotes unity in diversity. Unity in diversity, not formity. Uh, in integrity, dignity, compassion, solidarity, harmony, and inner peace. So FABC identifies three common concerns for harmony. The first concern is about ecology. The second one is about human dignity. And the third one is a recognition of uh, religious pluralism or cultural pluralism and interreligious harmony. The church leaders believe that this holistic vision of mission and life cannot be achieved unless the church, known as, the com as a community of disciples of Christ, contributes to the shaping of a better continent with people of all faith traditions. With this understanding and conviction, the church shifts its focus from take talking and doing interreligious dialogue to living inter-religious dialogue. So dialogue is not merely uh, doing, but it's living. Uh, this is called the spirituality of dialogue as we uh, heard from the video clip. This requires a proper training and formation. And FABC puts out a statement here, the people, the people at all levels must be prepared for dialogue through appropriate means of instruction and training in families, in basic communities, parishes, schools, seminaries, and religious formation houses, each one according to his role in, his, in the community. So to conclude this, um, they say, by living into religious dialogue, the church will purify herself from being self-centered as it reaches out to others in service, reconciliation, and friendship. And they believe that true dialogue demands the church to go beyond itself in being open to others with respect and co cooperation. And it is not only by going through, it is only by going through this kenosis that is, the church can be true servant of the people and sacrament of the kingdom. Kenosis is the uh, empty itself. Uh, the church got to be empty itself. So now that's the uh, the review of the uh, Asian Bishop Conference's teaching on interreligious dialogue. And now um, I move a bit to the dialogue in Australia um, is uh, a part of my research. So this is a, a, a some some of the observations I I just put it uh, briefly there. Interreligious relations in Australia are still at the level of peaceful coexistence rather than active cooperation. Faith, commu faith communities merely acknowledge and accept the existence of one another, 
but the interaction between them is still very limited. Faith communities are often too engaged in their survival to be bothered about ecumenical or interfaith activities. The engagement among faith group is still very limited. At the present, many faith communities in Australia are still at the stage of construction or reconstruction. Many of the temples, churches, mosques, tent centers are still being erected. Faith communities are trying to build up their leadership, pastoral needs, uh, which far exceeds uh, the availability of pastoral personnel requires the faith community's urgent response. So they are too busy with themselves. Uh, such realities uh, make each faith community focus on their interior affairs rather than on reaching out to build up relationships with other faith communities. Faith communities in Australia are still fundamentally in competition with each other for adherents and for converts. They still at that stage. Many followers have negative, misconceived ideas of other faiths and skilled versions of other faiths are presented in this ignorance. So people still think that Buddhists and Hindus worship stone statues through interview, this review strongly. Christian uh, evangelical and pet Pentecostal groups consider that some of the religions are the work of Satan. Some people allege that Christians are polytheistic. Others have an inadequate understanding of Islamic martyrdom. This skewed theological understanding generates negative attitudes of one group towards the others. Therefore, people believe that they need to work hard to convert others to their right path. And this includes um, uh, Christian or Catholic. But we have great uh, initiative. Most civic city council in Australia, responding to the uh, policy of multiculturalism, have established their local interfaith network and invited faith communities leaders to join membership in order to work to promote uh, peace and harmony among uh, uh, the communities. And now that uh, I finished with the observation on the interreligious dialogue in Australia, and now I move into my personal reflection of myself. So interreligious dialogue for me is a journey of encountering, of learning, and of course, of changing myself, and by accepting that transformation, personal religious uh, transformation takes place. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's an encounter, uh, a journey of encounter, and this encounter creates crisis. First of all, crisis. Um, so at the moment, uh, I, I've been, this is what I've, I've been doing. Um, uh, I have received some academic uh, theological training in interreligious dialogue by having um, done some research, two theses on interreligious dialogue in Australia, one for master's and one for PhD. And I'm in, I've been involved in different interfaith networks uh, in Australia, uh, including Catholic interested in interfaith dialogue of Melbourne Diocese. This group died. Uh, so now uh, the Diocese of Melbourne is almost has nothing to do with interfaith. Uh, I've been involved in Dandenong Interfaith Networks, Darabin Interfaith Networks, uh, Marunda Interfaith Networks, Knox Interfaith Networks. And with these networks, we normally organize uh, seminars, workshops on uh, certain uh, topics and themes. Uh, uh, to promote peace and harmony uh, among communities. Uh, and uh, I'm full time living and promoting interreligious dialogue at the Chanson Spiritual Spirituality Center in Melbourne, where Bill is living there and working there. And I'm part time teaching interreligious dialogue and comparative th 
here a study of religions at Yara Theological Union, Uni University of Divin uh, Divinity. And through all this, I'm still uh, at the stage of this crisis. So crisis, um, I, I got a uh, help from a sister who was, uh, who used to be in uh, China uh, with a Chinese character. I asked what is the word crisis uh, in Chinese? And she said it is the, the word Wei Qi. Uh, it's a combination of the two characters. Uh, one is danger, that is Wei, and Qi is an opportunity. And normally this, uh, this uh, danger or opportunity created by crisis uh, bring transformation. And I, I, I could relate to this very well in my journey, personal journey of uh, 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 inter-religious dialogue. So um, recently I spent almost three months living dialogue with Buddhism in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And um, it was a, a remarkable journey for me personally. Um, it's very intense. Um, I, I hope to have 10 hours uh, uh, meditation per day, but it turned out uh, the first day I have to do 12 hours and uh, a week later I have to do 14 hours per day and toward the end um, five days no sleeping <laughs> eating very uh, little uh, no sleeping at all uh, but 24 hours meditating and uh, out of that um, I had some experience there uh, uh, experience what they call nirvana uh, is quite interesting. It's difficult to describe, but it's a it's a, a total sense of peace and liberation. Uh, no more affected by uh, uh, irritation or hunger or uh, whatever uh, the the condition human condition. So it's it's a it's a journey for me of uh, personal transformation. Uh, through uh, meditation, so uh, the the photo, the first photo is where I I I sat every day, fourteen hours, and the second photo is the last day of my um, course. Uh, I finished, uh, and behind is the is my master, and the the third photo is where I came out and served the Buddhist community in Chiang Mai, so. Uh, this is a, a personal journey, but it's very transforming. Yeah? So now I would like to conclude with a small video clip. For me, because the world today is wounded, and interfaith or interreligious dialogue can take a place of offering some healing, some healing, uh, the wounded world. So the, the video... Uh, called the artist of King Su Chi. So I hope uh, you uh, can follow this one. <laughs> また私たち自身も壊れたりかけたりそれは日常のようにやってくることなんですそれを決して隠さない不完全であるからこそ新しいものが生まれると思います え、私は、え、京都で修復師をしております。え、清川博人と申します。この世界に入って45年目を迎えます。金継ぎというのは漆を使って壊れたものを修理してそこに金で装飾をする。そういう技法のことを言います。
漆、えー、で修復をしたものを金であしらうようになったのは、えー、特別感を持たせるより長く使い続けることより長く残すぞうとしたのが一番大きな原因だと思います。金継ぎの技法を使うのはやはり器が中心ですねご先祖さんが使ってた器であったりお気に入りの器であったりやはり何かの思いが入っている器の修理に使われてきましたね金継ぎをした箇所っていうのはいわば一つの新しい景色に日本人と漆っていうのは切っても切れない関係にあります漆の樹液自体は非常に貴重なもの日本の漆っていうのは一本の木からそのコップ一杯をいただいた時点で伐採になります。この樹液自体が血液なんですよね。それをいただいてしまうことによって漆の木の寿命を終わらせてしまう。そして自然に対する感謝の思いをそこへ持ってきましたね。その自然素材を人の手で時間をかけて手間暇をかけて加工するそれこそが自然との共存の持続可能な方法だと思ってます。金継ぎを実際やってみて本当にやっぱり時間がかかるものだということと本当にものを大切にするという気持ちが分かりました大体いい修復してきたものは自分が使っていたものが多いんですけれども地震で割れてしまったお皿であるとか自分が幼い頃から使っていた食器だとかどうしても捨てられるものではなくてそれは、えー、壊れてても捨てられないものだったんですでも多分それが今あまりなだんだん薄れていっているという気がしますが使い捨ての時代だと思うんですけれどもそういうものからもう少し自分で直しながら何かをしながら長くいいものを使うというそういう生活を取り戻していけたらいいなと思います。人の壊れた部分精神性も含めてですねその修復に一緒に関われたというかそれをすることで自分自身の壊れた部分も一緒に修復ができているような気持ちになります自分自身ももう一度修復ができるんだとそれはいつまでも諦めちゃダメだと思います。自分のキャリア自分の歴史を隠さないたと、えー、えそれが大きなアクシデントであってもそれは受け止めなければならないそしてそのアクシデントがあったから新しい自分が生まれるんだとそれは大きい思いですね。Elements, many factors, including、uh, wrong religious conviction. So, inter religious dialogue、uh, can be used as a, this、uh, form of art of k i n s u c h i to mend it, mend the world. So, thank you for your、uh, listening and attention. I, I've been too ambitious by putting too many things together,、uh, but hopefully、uh, it's okay for, for all. So thank you. Thank you very thank much, Stian, for that very comprehensive.
So let me just put a very comprehensive um, uh, presentation on interreligious engagement as a mission. Uh, I would like to open the floor up to comments, reactions, or questions from uh, any of us who are presenting here, uh, present here, even the ones with their cameras off. You can also uh, put your comments or questions in the chat box if you are uh, camera shy. Um, one of the things that uh, I, um, I I thought about as I listened to your presentation, uh, Tim, is that uh, dialogue is essentially communication, and communication starts with uh, self-awareness, because it's one of the first primary principles of communication is to know and understand yourself. And a lot of your communication then flows from that self-understanding. So when you present the struggle that the church uh, goes through in its various documents, to perceive itself vis-a-vis -vis other religious communities, uh, and religious uh, religious traditions, then we see that this is also very reflective of, of our individual struggles to understand ourselves first. And it's always a journey of understanding. And so my question then is, do you think the church has now fully arrived at a, a, a point of self-understanding that is conducive to interreligious dialogue, or is there still more discerning that needs to take place in this uh, self-awareness uh, endeavor? Thank you, Anthony, for such a very difficult question. I am not the expert in the, uh, the, uh, the church uh, studies, but uh, I think um, I can follow Needers by saying that uh, without Buddhism, I cannot be a true Christian. So the church is still struggling with itself. Its definition of evangelization, especially in terms of salvation and uh, dialogue. So I think uh, for the present time, uh, Pope Francis is trying to stay away from all these definitions, but moving forward into working with brothers and sisters of other traditions. So instead of um, uh, sitting there and uh, talking about others <laughs> and uh, giving definition about their, uh, their faith or their traditions, um, and now I think uh, with uh, Francis, Pope Francis, uh, the church is moving forward a bit, but uh, some observations uh, show that the church is now waned by uh, this enterprise of interreligious dialogue. Uh, so it, it came up for some time and now it's almost dying. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't see itself uh, as uh, a, a person of dialogue. Um, and as you say, uh, we, we are a dialogical uh, entity. Yeah? Uh, but uh, now, I just take uh, Melbourne Diocese as an example. Uh, there used to be an office for uh, interreligious dialogue and ecumenism. And uh, just a few years ago, I think in uh, 2019, early 2019, this office was uh, dispersed. Uh, they, they closed down the, the, the office. So they don't see the importance of dialogue is such um, and and I'm afraid that the church is now is trying to uh, yeah moving through a, a, a new process of um, uh, what they call the journey together um, wh what is it called um, synodal yeah synodal synod synod synodality so hopefully later on after uh, being settled with all this uh, Interreligious dialogue may come up, but I think at the moment uh, the, uh, it is not very hopeful. Thank you for that. Yes, uh, Tony, please. Um, I'd like to give a perspective from from the pews rather than uh, a theological expert. I'm a member of the Lash community, 
Now, many of you may know L'Arche, founded in Tralee in France, where we share life with people with intellectual disability. It began as a Catholic-based faith community. When our communities began in India, they began as interfaith communities where Muslims, Christians, and Hindus shared life together. We have this common phrase, we are about sharing life together. It's a lived experience. My experience, my experience of Lash has taken me into the interfaith, beyond dialogue, into the interfaith experience, that spirituality of living. One of my roles I have in Australia is hosting a monthly half-hour Zoom prayer. And part of the challenge has been incorporating the diverse spirituality of people who've come to our communities, even in Australia. We have Hindus, we have Muslims, we have people of no faith who come to experience community, engage in the conversation and dialogue, and share life. So they're the key. And Theon, I'm really grateful for the, your summary of the key documents and those key phrases. But I think from, uh, I don't hold a lot of hope. I look at my local parishes around here and I don't look to them for interfaith initiatives. I'm lucky, I'm honoured that I've had the experience with a large community. Like yourself, I've not quite the, as intense as you have. I had the experience many years ago of time with B. Griffiths, the Benedictine, who lived in an ashram in India. So my journey began. But I just want to highlight uh, a community like Lash could be one of the signs of hope for the church, as many people do still associate Lash with Catholicism. And I don't know whether you've had any of that experience. Yeah, thank you, uh, Tony. Um... um... My personal experience uh, uh, in, in interfaith dialogue is that interfaith dialogue is now carried out by laity and by people of no faith. They engage. Uh, and and um, through the network, I could see that uh, people who, who are struggling with their faith, they come to interfaith. Uh, because you know they they find themselves not belonging anywhere, so interfaith is a place for them. So that is normally the case uh, that uh, I I I I could experience in uh, Victoria. And uh, just to share an experience, when I was uh, doing a case studies in uh, Dandenong um, of Victoria, is uh, Dandenong Interfaith Network. So I every month I got a meeting with. Uh, a group of priests and bishop. So we had lunch together. And after several months, uh, the bishop asked me, young, this young man, what are you doing here? We are all senior and you should do something outside. And I said, I am here to study about you. I, I was writing my thesis on uh, interfaith dialogue in Victoria. So bishop asked me, could you sit down and talk to us? So I started as I started talking about interfaith dialogue and what I found, all priests left the table. Only bishop remained there. He couldn't go because he asked me the question. So interfaith, I think, is not for everyone. It is quite difficult uh, thing to do. And not everyone uh, finds it easy to, to accept it. Uh, and it is always a struggle. Uh, Thank you, uh, Tony. Uh, other comments, questions, reactions? Yes, Bill. I'll just uh, comment that one of the, at the very beginning of your talk, Jen, you quoted, now I'm not sure even, I didn't note who said this, but about interfaith engagement not being about conversion but completion i found that really really good that's all i just make that comment thank you thank you i i, I find that interesting too because um, that's from a, a muslim uh, representative mm -hmm. 
I invite other comments, questions. Yes, Maurice. Comment, just a comment. Um, I'm over here in South Australia in Port Pirie. Um, the town's quite ecumenical. Um, there's like a ministers' association and the different um, Christian churches quite work quite well together. There is a group for the um, yeah other churches, but I'm only on a Facebook page um, or WhatsApp group at this stage. But there's a I've joined Zooms by Fen the Faith Ecology Network. I noticed earlier you mentioned the word ecology, and that's a group that certainly um, people of different faiths are collaborating is probably a good word, together, you know, for that purpose of yeah, ecological um, issues. So maybe sometimes it's a theme that helps people to work together, yeah, or project. Mm. Thank you, Marie. I think uh, ecology is now a, 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 a issue that uh, the, the, the Pope invites the church and the world to engage in. Yeah. I, I have a question, um, I think related to what, what I said earlier about uh, self-awareness. So, for some people, there's a concern about interreligious dialogue like this. Let's say if we compare interreligious engagement as a football game or a basketball game, then everybody who enters into the football match has the same set of rules that's been objectively set for how the rule is, how the game is to be played, and everyone is how to engage and what everybody's attitude ought to be in order for that game to be a successful game. And if you don't enter into that game with the same spirit or the same acceptance of the rule, then the game is not going to be an orderly game and you'll probably end up in fights and being very chaotic. Now, have you made any comparative examination of how different religious religions view and approach interreligious dialogue. I mean, are there similarities and differences like in the way various religions struggle with viewing themselves vis-a-vis -vis, um, other religions, um, you know, as uh, as experienced by the Catholic Church, you know, because what we what we know and what you presented is the struggle and the experience and the approach and the theology of the Catholic Church towards interreligious dialogue. But then what is the Muslim theology approach attitude towards interreligious dialogue? What is the official or, 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 or uh, accepted Buddhist approach and or Jewish and so on and so forth? Do they have documents that are comparative to conciliar teachings where then we can compare and say, okay, now we're sort of on the same plane, you know? And if there isn't, how can we engage in interreligious dialogue in a way that where everybody comes with sort of a, with a similar set of understanding as we do to a football match? Yes, thank you, Anthony. Um is a very interesting question. Uh, I haven't thought about it, but uh, my quick response is that um, interreligious dialogue, uh, our understanding of interreligious dialogue is initiated by the Catholic uh, theology. Um, so far, I don't find any, I don't see any other faith traditions that uh, has carried out a, in a systematic way of developing uh, understanding or strategy or policy on interreligious dialogue. Recently, I, I was in Thailand and I tried to enter into dialogue with the monks. And for them, no, it's, it's not, uh, it's not a, a, a thing to do. Um, okay, it's leaving, it is okay. 
But talking, no, don't talk. You sit down, you meditate, and you show me who you are. Uh, so I don't think they have any, uh, they have suggestions, but they don't have guidelines like uh, Dalai Lama. He came out with some nice words and some approaches uh, to others, but uh, they don't develop as a, a policy or a systematic theology. Uh, but the Catholic, uh, in particular, do uh, does that uh, has done that. Uh, so it's still remain. It's it is still a difficult thing because for other religions, yes, we invite them to come to the table to to dialogue, but rarely they take initiatives in inviting mm -hmm. others or organizing um, uh, events. Eh? So it's still. Uh, I think one-sided uh, enterprise, but it's, it's a very interesting question, Anthony. I will go uh, into exploration of this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, any last quick comments, reactions? It is now almost nine p.m. Melbourne time. Yes, Tony. Just a quick response to that um, conversation. One of the interesting things certainly happening around Australia are the mosque open days. And that's been going on for a few years now, particularly after the Christchurch bombings. And that whole idea of a mosque open day, inviting the community to come, even Catholics don't do that. <laughs> but I I think that's another, um, this is interesting, Tien, the, the different approaches the major faith traditions have to this question. They don't use the same language, but they have, practices, and we're certainly seeing that within the Islamic tradition, this week, the number of people celebrating Diwali in the general community and the awareness of Diwali. I think we need, and um, we as Catholics aren't good at capitalising on these opportunities. And this would have been a wonderful opportunity. Imagine if every Catholic parish sent a Diwali greeting out into the community just to raise awareness. There are little yeah. things like that we can do. Maybe we need a little um, cheat sheet, Tien, to send around to the bishops so they can give it to the clergy on what to do at Diwali, what to do during Ramadan, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah, thank you, Tony, for such a very interesting observation. Thanks, Tony, for that uh, wonderful insight there. And uh, yeah, I'll be just listening. But Tien, it's having a wonderful conversation here. And uh, it's nice to see you. And also, I wanted to hear about uh, your experience in Thailand in doing meditation 10 hours to 12 hours a day. Mm -hmm. I have done it myself, the Vipassana meditation, and uh, it really disciplines you. And uh, it's, it's good to hear about your, your experience of doing meditation. And I think it has op this conversation has opened up a lot, a lot of things, as uh, Marie was saying about the we can work on on certain project, you know, keeping aside our faith affiliations and working together in a, on a particular project, you know. Uh, but I think even in my study, I remember back in Rome, I always struggled to find that balance between how to be faithful in preaching Christ as the savior, but at the same time, how do we embrace an interfaith and be open to to other other faiths and you know, people welcoming a, a welcoming church you know i think it's an ongoing ongoing discussion or ongoing conversation that we need to have but i think as catholics we are having that proactive approach in opening up uh, our doors and that has been right from the start in 1965 remember pope paul the 6th or john the 23rd when he said let's open up doors and windows it's it's suffocating in here you know uh, and that led to the Vatican Council in 1965. And then, even if I remember Cardinal Oswald Gracias from India, he said, living dialogue has been for years for India. We have been living dialogue from, from the beginning, you know. It's like a, the Catholic Church only put a seal only after 1965 to make it more official. But we have been living dialogue for years, you know. Um, so it's a very interesting conversation and thank you for opening up also giving us that uh, 
leading us to the church documents, but also your experience of experiencing dialogue and doing dialogue and practicing dialogue in Australia. And also, I love that uh, the the last video that you played about uh, to give importance to our uh, some of the brokenness that we have in each one of us. Sometimes secular culture today gives more importance to the successes that each of us have. It doesn't give more importance to the brokenness that each of us carry. I think we have a role to play in that. How to how do we bring about healing in people when they walk into our centers and and help them, making them whole again. I think that's a wonderful ministry that we can have in the world today. So thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. No. Well, I um, uh, I remember something from the sutras where the Buddhist uh, says, um, there are four kinds of people, uh, those who help themselves, but not others, those who help others, but not themselves, those who do things that help neither themselves nor others, and those who do things to help themselves as well as others. And the Buddha says the last group of people are the most noble, the most exalted people. So as I was listening to Albano, I think we as the church take the proactive action of doing interreligious dialogue in order to help ourselves as well as to help others to become beneficial to all of humanity. And so um, it is an effort that we need to continue to do whether others take initiative or not, or whether others respond positively to our uh, initiatives or not. So, yeah, Anthony, if I could make a little contribution here. Okay. Um, if you go on the US US website and if you look, you just type the level the leaven of good. The leaven of good. There's a nice video which was made when I was studying in Rome uh, of, of the hundred years of the release of the document of Nostra Aetate. I have the DVD myself, but it is available online free, which is called uh, the leaven of good. If you can watch that. It will give you a very good background about what the Catholic Church is all about when it deal engages with the uh, interfaith dialogue for the last hundred years. Yeah. Uh, the leaven of good, and there are beautiful videos by different lay people who are engaged in interfaith dialogue. Small synopsis, but it's very good to from all around the world. Wonderful introduction to interfaith series. I do that in my class when I do. Uh, when it comes to uh, introduction to theology of mission and all of that. Thank you, Abano, for that information. I think we have now run out of time officially. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Ken, for this fine presentation, insightful, and leaves us with a lot to think about and reflect on, uh, not only in our uh, missionary and pastoral work, but also in our academic uh, endeavors. Um, this is the conclusion of the series of lectures on the theme of mission and dialogue. Uh, we look forward to next year's uh, series of lectures, uh, which uh, we have not decided on the theme yet. Uh, we will certainly decide on the theme, and then we will uh, 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 share the information as soon as we have uh, that set. Uh, this was the first time we've done this series of lectures, and uh, uh, there were a, a little bit of fits and starts with some of the programs, but we've managed to make it through, and um, we thank you for all, all your contribution uh, with the various speakers, as well as uh, those who participated in the discussions. Um, so um, I'm going to put Bill on the spot again and ask Bill to give the final words of thanks for today as well as this year, uh, this series of lectures. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Anthony. And just very briefly, thanks particularly for TN for tonight for that most interesting and informative uh, pr uh, presentation. And as we do conclude uh, the series, uh, thanks to everybody who's been involved. Each, each one has been different but has been very, uh, been very well prepared and 
have provided very interesting, stimulating information. So thank you all very much. And I just pray your blessing, pray the Lord's blessing on us all this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. See you. Thank you very much and good night. See you again on this. Yeah. Forum. Can I yes. ask? Can I ask if they're going to be available? Um, they're recorded tonight. I haven't been able to attend most sessions. Are there? Is there a place where they can be viewed? They, uh, they, Marie. Uh, if you could give us your email address, we can forward it to you. Right. Yeah, I can't write it on here though, can I? Uh, are the chats? Uh, I can't find yeah. the chat. Oh. Normally, I can. Oh. Is it under, it's is it under more? Our website, uh, SVD website of Australia. All oh, right, I'll go to the website. Yes, SVD website. Okay. Yeah, just, just give us an email. Yeah, I, I can't. Yeah, I can't write it on here. Okay, no, just, I can say I it mean, to you. Yeah. No, it's I, M. I just... Okay. It's M O S H E A. H E A. Yeah, at. Okay. Good Sam's. All lowercase. Yeah. Dot org dot au. So M O S H E A at goodsams dot org dot au. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Welcome. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Clement. You. All the behind the Thank you, Anthony. Thank you so <laughs> Bye -bye. much. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.